Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Talmadge, along with Pastor Nanette Christofferson and our intern Kevin Anderson. Each week we try to provide you a brief look at two of the assigned Bible readings for the upcoming Sunday. We're going to take a look at the Old Testament reading for Sunday, October 20th, 2024. It's out of the major prophet Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 12. Uh, as some of you are aware, doing Bible study in the past, when scholars look at the book of Isaiah and you read through the book of Isaiah, when you get towards chapter 42 and into 53, you see that there are four servant songs in Isaiah. And so I've listed uh, those and you can read all four of those and just kind of get a comparison of what the message might be. But the big question for scholars is who is the servant? Uh, the servant is never named, but he is anointed with God's spirit. And the servant will bring God's justice and teaching to the people God wants the servant to speak to. Uh, the servant will do this quietly and gently. And I think that's an important uh, characteristic or, 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 or quality of the servant, uh, personality of the servant, uh, that the servant's not going to beat anybody over the head. They're not going to bully anybody into listening to them. They're going to do this quietly and gently without lifting his voice and without violence. Pay attention to that. Quietly, gently, without lifting one's voice, without violence. Scholars debate, who is this servant? And so, as scholars like to debate, I got a bunch of Jewish rabbis here who are noted for put 20 rabbis in the same room and give them a passage of scripture. You're going to have 20 arguments over what's the right way to see this. Uh, and that might be true in any other kind of profession as well. But uh, we have one answer is it's the prophet Isaiah. Uh, uh, the second is it's the people of Israel. Uh, as a people group, they are to be the servant of God to the world. And so Jewish readers saw the servant corporately as Israel. Their identity was to be blessed, to be a blessing. Remember back in Genesis 12. For Christians, whenever we read the servant song, we immediately, particularly, uh, you know, the passage we're going to see today, we jump to Jesus. We tend to see that the servant is an individual, not a group of people. And, uh, and how Isaiah describes this servant fits very clearly with Jesus, who is a servant, who suffers, is rejected, and bears the sin of many. Current scholarship, the four servant songs must be read contextually. And by doing this, Israel seems clearly uh, to be God's servant here. So we tend as Christians to read it backwards from Jesus but as the first hearers of the song, they don't have Jesus in their memory like you and I do. They tend to see it in the context of Isaiah offering the song up and it's speaking to a people. But the task of the servant can be read as coming from the voice of an individual or prophet. A particular member of Israel might serve as a representative of the whole. So, again, the, the big answer is who is the servant? We don't know. We don't know. But current scholarship says the servant more than likely is applied to the people of Israel, but there may be a particular spokesperson representative of the people who operates in the role of this servant. We as Christians tend to read backwards through Christ, and so we see Jesus in it. But these original words were not written. They were written 600 years before Jesus. Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12 is the fourth servant song, as mentioned earlier. The context. God's people are being called out of Babylon and granted permission with King Cyrus's edict in 538 before Common Era. Any Jew who wanted would be allowed to return to Israel and they could rebuild the temple of their God. And so not everyone left Babylon when they had a choice. Some had gotten married to Babylonians or other uh, diaspora uh, captives or refugees. Uh, they had started a life. They had begun a new life. But there were others out of their religious identity, out of their desire to go home, uh, 
accepted that invitation to return, and they did. And so the book of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament talk about the rebuilding of that temple. And, uh, and we see that the people of Israel are given a second chance to reestablish themselves in the promised land to return to that role of being God's servant. They struggled with it, though. The suffering servant, verse 13, shall, be, shall prosper and be exalted. The people shall prosper and be exalted. 14, the people will be astonished. So marred was his appearance beyond human semblance. So if we apply the servant to a people who've been uh, taken in exile, their temple, their, their walled city, capital Jerusalem had been destroyed by a powerful army, a powerful uh, global power. Uh, now uh, uh, they're coming back and they're going to be prosper and be exalted. This is a radical transformation. Verse 15, startle nations. Kings shall shut their mouths for that which had not been told them they shall see and that which they had not heard they contemplate. This reestablishment of Israel, the rebuilding of the temple, the reestablishment of God's blessed to be a blessing people is going to be a shakeup to the global world order at least in the context of Isaiah. And other neighboring kings are going to say, wow, a people who have been kicked off the land are now back on the land. An opportunity is given to them to start again. The kings and nations will recognize that the servant Israel had in fact suffered on their behalf. This would have surprised them because Israel was deemed as insignificant in the scheme of global economic politics. Israel is a small country. But even being a small country, they had influence among their neighbors. They would have regarded its suffering and disgrace as the consequence of Israel's own failures. God now brings all people to himself by placing their sins, diseases, and failings on God's servant. God will win over the nations not by military defeat, but through voluntary suffering of the servant. That sets them free to see everything in a new way. This is how we tend to read Christ into this picture and into this story. We see that Israel, as a servant of God, is not going to win over the nations by overpowering them with a mighty armor. But God is going to win the people over by the witness and the willingness of God's people willing to suffer on behalf of their neighbor of others. Isaiah 53, 1-3, listen to the song notice. No form of majesty, no form or majesty, nothing in his appearance, despised and rejected, a man of suffering, acquainted with infirmity, Other, others hide their faces because of the ugliness, despised. I put here a copy of the movie, The Elephant Man, which many years ago, some of us may have watched. And it's based on the true story. Uh, it was nominated for eight Academy Awards, but The Elephant Man suffered a horrific, uh, a, a, a horrific physiological disorder that distorted his body and his face. And so distorted was his face. He wore a sack over his face with just these eye holes. But there was a doctor who reached out to him, who offered compassion and discovered that beyond that outward reflection was a beautiful person, worthy of love and value. And in many ways, through the suffering of Israel, through the suffering of the servant, God is demonstrating God's ability to take what the world values and what the world lifts up and turns it upside down and to demonstrate where real power, real force for change, is when we're willing to get over ourselves and live for others. Even if it means we go through what Isaiah 53, 1-3 lists. 4-6, to six, the unveiling. As the observers reflect on the servant, they see one who's borne our infirmities, carried our diseases, wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. His punishment made us whole. His bruises healed us. We are sheep gone astray. He has taken on our iniquity. 
Walter Wangren, a uh, Lutheran pastor and author, wrote a little story called The Ragman. It's a wonderful little parable fitting to this and to Jesus dying on the cross. The ragman would collect everybody's rags from their wounds and, and their cast off and all that stuff. And he'd call out every day, rags, rags, rags. And he would take on the brokenness of the village that he was a part of and transform people's pain into new life. This is what Isaiah is describing Israel's role and purpose is. Jesus epitomizes that as he comes, revealing the full image of God. 53, 7 to 9. The servant is seen as a sacrificial land, did not open his mouth, perverted justice, led to his being stricken for the transgression of my people, buried among the wicked, and a tomb with the rich, he had done no violence and spoke no deceit. So we see a parallel to the Good Friday story, the burial of Jesus in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. But again, God is showing transformation out of the unexpected. 10 to 12, suffering leads to redemption and transformation. Through him, many will be declared righteous. He bore the sin of many. He will make intercession for the transgressors. This is our hope. Though the people of Israel didn't accomplish the task, God chooses to accomplish that task through Jesus. And if we take time to really look at Jesus' death for us and for the world, we begin to discover the power of how God really changes hearts and minds. It's not by overpowering us with might. It's overpowering us with love. Here and elsewhere, ancient Israelites made sense of their exilic suffering by viewing it as redemptive and necessary. Note there's no claim for this as the explanation for all suffering. The belief that all pain is divinely imposed for the sake of some higher good may cruelly trivialize and even blame victims for their suffering and prevent seeking solutions to end injustice. Indeed, the glorification of the silent and docile victim in this passage may be triggering for some survivors of trauma. We're not glorifying suffering here. It's complicated. It is true that sometimes the suffering of one group or individual turns out to be redemptive for another, but by no means is that always the case. It is one thing to discover a God-given transformative outcome on the other side of suffering, blanket assertions that God preordained all suffering as necessary and meaningful have historically resulted in theological justification of violence. So uh, Dr. Lisa Wolf advises us, be careful how we look at this and understand and interpret it, because not all suffering is redemptive, but some suffering is. Takeaway, if the prophet was setting forth a model of faithful Israelite service, then any Jew who sought to emulate that pattern would resemble this servant. Jesus is a Jew whose life and death model such integrity and who for us Gentiles offers a doorway into biblical faith. If we can seek to emulate the servant's faithfulness and that of Jesus himself in choosing to bear other sins, we'll be reading Isaiah 53 for all it's worth. So wrote Dr. Patricia Tall. Reflect on this passage. Think about who the servant is for you and how suffering has been or might be redemptive for you, but be careful as you try to apply that in all cases of suffering. God bless. Take care.